The 1990s, dawn of the new decade. A lot happened really fast after the decade flipped. I serendipitously met Parker in February, who I immediately began singing with after having one date and deciding our fate would be a musical one. Luckily for me, music arrived in my life just in time to save and soothe my broken heart after the letdown of New Year's Eve a few weeks prior. It was all I wanted to do now. A few months later, in June 1990, I met my future second husband, Scott, and by the end of that summer, Parker had met his first wife. So the four of us packed a big U-Haul and moved to Lexington, Kentucky to be the house band five nights a week at JDI, the Jefferson Davis Inn, a historic pub and building where Scott and I lived upstairs in the apartment above the bar, the same apartment where Jefferson Davis lived when he was going to Transylvania University. It was situated, appropriately, at 7 High Street in downtown Lexington, right down the street from the University of Kentucky. The decade rolled along with a move back to Connecticut, and two years later, yet another decision to try my hand at California one more time. For this go-round, I would move to Northern California by myself. I was leaving Scott and moving to Marin to live with my ex-roommate from our days at 48 back in Connecticut, Matt Peak who would let me stay on his couch in Santa Fe until I got my bearings straight. Matt is my most talented and personally influential artist friend from Connecticut who moved to Marin a couple of years before me. When we first met back in West Newark, Connecticut in 1985, Matt was waiting to get paid from the then fledgling film company he worked for, creating the original artwork for all the Nightmare on Elm Street movie posters. Short on cash and in need of a place to live, Matt traded his low-number, natural blonde Rickenbacker bass in payment for his first two months of rent at 48. As our friendship unfolded, he proceeded to teach me how to play that bass, as well as coercing me to open my mouth and sing. He captured the magic on tape in his music studio, which allowed me to hear my voice for the very first time in my life. I was so high from singing that whole night, I couldn't wait to wake Karen up in the morning back at 48 and tell her my life-changing news. I sang. So I touched down in 1992 for my second shot at California. When I crossed the Golden Gate Bridge for the first time and drove through the Rainbow Tunnel to Marin, I could swear I saw the clouds part and heard the angels sing as I descended Waldo Grade. With Sausalito and the sparkling bass sprawling before me, I was stunned by the palpable beauty of which I had just been anointed. It took a bit of pavement pounding and library time researching. Internet was not a thing at the time, nor were cell phones. A lot of cold calls and a little luck, but I soon landed a freelance advertising production artist job at a hot little San Francisco ad agency at 77 Main Lane called GMO, Goldberg, Moser, O'Neill. There, along with peers Mike Moser and Brian O'Neill, a scrappy team of creatives, and several quirky fellow production artists, we deftly crafted advertising for clients like Reebok, rice a and Dryer's Ice Cream, as well as launching Dell Computer and Kia Motors. Success ensued along with Scott moving out to California to be with me. While I climbed the rungs of the advertising world as a graphic artist, Scott and I got married while I lived in Novato in the shade of the roundhouse and I made a move to become Senior Vice President and Studio Director at Hal Reine & Partners, the largest ad agency in San Francisco at the time. That was in 1997. It was a heady time, and I was fortunate enough to scrap together $12,000 from my meager 401k savings to put down a small down payment on a red-tagged, uninhabitable cottage in Point Reyes Station. Thanks to a miracle-working mortgage broker, I got approved for two crappy mortgages to finance the deal with my little money down. When I shook George Sumner's hand at the closing, he had an envious sparkle in his eye as he handed me the keys to his former little art gallery. And that's how I successfully acquired my very own construction project that Dad would have been proud of. As the decade turned towards its close, the storyline veered off in another direction, meandering into the realms of sadness and pain, infidelity and sanity and crime. In November 1998, on the eve of my 35th birthday, I was standing on the back deck of the house with my friend Christine, 
surveying the spoils that lay before us while Scott happily plied the back acre. In a moment of innocence, at the pinnacle of my naive bliss and overflowing with joy and gratitude, I spontaneously exclaimed to my friend, I am the happiest girl in the world. That single blissful moment in time is impressed on my brain forever. I had no clue at that moment that I was precariously perched on the precipice of the unimaginable. The next morning, as Scott was out buying my birthday cake and Christmas trees to plant in the yard, I began receiving tormenting calls from his ex-boss's wife. My calm response to her repeated calls was not what she was seeking. Then, possessed with rage, this woman scorned dealt the news of my husband's misdeeds to me with all the finesse of an atomic bomb blast. To my amazement, I didn't react as she had expected or wanted. I calmly told her to stop calling and to leave us alone because I was aware of the situation, I lied, and that Scott and I were working things out. After a few seconds of stunned silence, she shrieked a cruel and nasty comment at me about my weight, then threatened to kill me. In that instant, I became the target of a mean, psychotic, hate-filled stalker woman who chose to focus on trying to destroy my life because I wanted to work things out with my husband. The police had to tap our phone lines. She was incessant, even with a restraining order from the court. She continued stalking me, making graphic threats against my life, my home, my husband, my career. She'd follow me in her car. I never knew when or where she would show up. Throughout all this, I tried desperately to maintain some semblance of stability in my day-to-day existence. I tried. Ultimately, the phone tap captured the evidence and the situation culminated with her arrest and conviction for multiple felony terrorist threats. Shortly thereafter, broken down by the cancerous, creeping devastation, my husband retreated back east to the safety of his parents' home in Darien, Connecticut, and I remained out west in Point Reyes, now the singular keeper of dreams once shared by two. Peering into the abyss of the upcoming millennium, I found myself heartbroken and completely wrecked, feeling alone and drowning in a sea of all the things I thought I could ever want in this life. I was broken, obliterated, and hurt to my core, while, by the minute, growing larger than I had ever been in my life. Forty was speeding up on me fast. I had to take some drastic measures. And that's the story for the 2000s.